Bill, first off, thank you so much for being in here with me today. Uh, very exciting day, very successful day. Uh, why don't you tell us a little bit about uh, what we got to see this morning? Yeah, it was uh, really my pleasure to be down here and actually get to, to witness the capture and berthing of the Dragon spacecraft to the space station. Uh, again, uh, I was here for the for the demonstration flight, and uh, I got to, to watch a little bit of the, the tension as, as we learned how some of the systems would actually operate and work. And then I got to see the results today of where they took the lessons learned from that previous demonstration mission and um, the, the LIDARs, the thermal imagers, all the equipment that was needed to make this work just worked extremely smooth. Um, the, I can't say enough about the crew on orbit that was really ready to go do the capture. Uh, Aki was ready to do the capture. They did it a little bit early, and uh, it worked out really well. And uh, the control center team here and the team out in Hawthorne and with SpaceX just did a phenomenal job of making a, a pretty complex ballet in space look pretty easy. And uh, it was not easy by any stretch of the imagination, but they just did a great job. And it's, it's great to have the Dragon spacecraft on board the space station today. So not, not easy by any stretch. A lot of milestones overcome throughout the years that we've been working side by side with SpaceX. Talk about some of, some of the milestones we had to overcome to get to this point. Yeah, I think what's really uh, interesting and fun for me is I get a chance to kind of step back and see the teams interact and work with each other. And, and the beauty is really them working together. Um, the, the SpaceX uh, team has some new creative ways of doing business that are a little different than the way we would have done business from a NASA standpoint. The NASA team gets to see that. They get to learn from that. They can actually react and implement that in their ways of doing business. The NASA team also has some ways they've been doing things along, uh, you know, they've learned throughout history. Um, and then the SpaceX team sees those, and at first they maybe kind of reject some of those ideas, some of the ideas for configuration control and how we monitor things and watch things. is a little different than what they're used to, and they discount those uh, initially, and then after a while they start saying, hey, you know, this is really, now we understand what you NASA guys have been doing, and they modify their stuff a little bit together. So, so the beauty is, like in any teaming relationship, if you come together with an open mind and you look together and you work together and you have that common goal, you, you can achieve so much more as a combined team than you can individually and I think it's just a, it's a real pleasure for me to get to watch the best of spaceflight come out in the SpaceX team and the best of spaceflight come out in the NASA team to, to end up with this wonderful event that occurred today with this capture and berthing. So really bringing in kind of the best of both worlds, some old school NASA knowledge, some new blood from SpaceX making this Dragon capsule successful, really exciting stuff. So now uh, first commercial resupply mission, birth to the International Space Station. What does this mean for NASA? Why is this important? You know, again, I think this is tremendously important. When we retired the shuttle, we needed a way to get, you know, scientific investigations as well as necessary supplies, crew equipment, food, other things to and from space station. And we entered into the, the commercial uh, orbital transportation system activity with the Space Act agreements with both uh, Orbital and with SpaceX. Now this is the first commercial flight where we're buying essentially services to, to carry up uh, things to orbit. And I think the thing we miss sometimes is the uh, exciting cargo that is really on board this flight. There's some critical components that we needed to get launched to station. They're there. Um, probably the most important thing for this flight is this will allow us to return some samples from space station. Um, there's a glacier freezer that's on board as well as some cold packs that are in the, in the Dragon capsule. We have... Um, three minus 85 degree freezers on board space station. Uh, we've not returned anything from those freezers since the shuttles uh, quit flying last year. So they're stock full of really precious blood samples for the crew because we're trying to monitor how the, the blood chemistry changes over time dur during an expedition. Um, there's uh, also biological samples in there. Um, there's also some plant samples where we had some plants that we've uh, fixated the plants and then we froze them in the minus 85 degree freezer. So these are unbelievably unique and precious specimens. And, you know, they've been, they've been uh, captured, the unique presence of space station. They're in, locked in these frozen samples are potentially information that can reveal a lot about what microgravity is and how it works in a biological sense. So those are sitting up there. They're waiting to come home. They need a way to come home. Our freezers were starting to get full, so we're going to take 
uh, approximately one third of the, the samples that have been stored in those freezers on orbit, put them in this glacier freezer, and then get a chance to return them here to the Earth on the Dragon capsule at the end of the mission. So it's not only the up mass, but it's also given us the ability to return this precious cargo. So uh, I look at the, the vision of where we were when we laid out this concept to, to go move forward, to bring in some commercial providers to provide services for us. Um, there were a lot of skeptics at the beginning, but as evidence today, I think you're starting to see that this can, can work and can move forward. And I think we also need to not lose sight of how difficult this is. So if a problem occurs, we just need to react to that and not lose faith in what we're doing and just continue to keep moving forward. Uh, you know, we're, we're, it'll be exciting to get these samples back. It'll be exciting to see some of this research uh, actually get investigated by the folks here on the ground. And, and Dragon is allowing us to do that with this return portion of the flight coming up. So really excited. We're, I mean, science such a huge part of the International Space Station, such an integral part. Now all those important samples have a ride back down to Earth. Talk a little bit, uh, a little bit earlier, you were telling me about some of the really cool science experiments that we have going on. Tell me a little bit about some of those. Yeah, what, what's going on on station is we have uh, an aquarium, a fish habitat that was launched on the HTV and it's been installed by Aki on board station. It's there, it's been checked out, it's ready to be operated and used. The fish are coming up on the Soyuz uh, flight and I was down here not only for the capture and berthing, but I was down here for the flight readiness review for the Soyuz flight. And on that Soyuz flight, we'll fly up some uh, Makata fish that will actually inhabit the aquarium. And, and what's intriguing about that is we've we were looking at bone loss potentially with this. We've flown these fish before in space for a 16-day mission, but we've never been able to fly them for 60 or 90 days. And if you think about it, you know, humans that walk around on the Earth, we experience bone loss in space, but our systems are loaded by one gravity. You know, mm -hmm. the, the bones are stressed by just walking around on the Earth, or we fly rodents, same kind of thing. Their bones are loaded by one gravity. The fish bones are not loaded by one gravity. They're essentially swimming around in the in, in the lakes or oceans or, or aquariums here on the Earth. So it's much like our neutral buoyancy facility where we go simulate microgravity for our crew members. These fish experience that all the time. So now we'll fly these fish to space, put them in this habitat on board space station, and then we'll go look and see if they actually have the same bone loss phenomena that the, that the terrestrially 1G one load, one loaded uh, other animals have, or there's something different that goes on. And what this will do is this will allow the researchers to get more insight into the mechanism behind bone loss that occurs in space. So is it truly a, a one gravity loading condition? Can you compensate for it by putting the crews on treadmills and loading them with bungees mm -hmm. or doing the um, ad, you know, advanced or risk, uh, resistive exercise device that they use, the ARAD? Can we accommodate that or is there something else that's fundamentally going on? So what's exciting is these fish will give us another insight into this phenomenon we observe in space. And we've really got to learn to control these things if we're going to go beyond low Earth orbit, go to asteroids, go to Mars, get out into space. We're going to be exposed to long durations of, of microgravity conditions and we need to understand how to control those symptoms. So this experiment that's coming up on the Soyuz will be very important to give us some of the uh, some insight into bone loss we've not been able to see before. So mm -hmm. again, it, it's exciting. We have to dig a little bit to see what the science is going on aboard space station, but there's lots of great investigations every day on board the space station. Do they put in a little plastic ca a little plastic castle in that fish tank for the... I, I don't think there's a little like plastic uh, um, uh, castle or any plastic plants in there, but okay. you'll get a chance to see some of the video from station we'll, when the we'll, fish get We'll definitely get be following along with it. So yeah. again, Dragon Commercial Resupply, getting into full swing, but they're, SpaceX isn't our only partner in the commercial resupply. We have another partner who's moving through and well on their way to soon supplying the International Space Station, and that's Orbital. Yep, and Orbital is, in, they're gonna launch out of Wallops, uh, Virginia, and uh, Wallops Island, Virginia. Um, they're out on the launch pad now. They've just moved the rocket out uh, last week, and they uh, lifted it up and installed it on the launch pad. Um, you know, they had to build essentially a launch pad from scratch. There was no launch pad for this rocket before. So they had to put in not only the cement infrastructure and the facility that holds the holds rockets, but they had to put in a, you know, propellant system that can handle cryogenic oxygen and, and uh, kerosene to deliver it to the rocket. And also there's some helium that needs to be supplied, et cetera. So there was a lot of buildup of the launch really just pad. just ground up. Building it yeah, from essentially a, 
open beach to essentially a launch pad. So they've been very busy getting that in place. Um, there's been some, you know, typical problems as they check things out. Valves don't quite function right. Systems leak a little bit. Some flanges needed to be retorqued. So they've been working through all those problems. But now they're at the point where the rocket is out on the launch pad. They'll do some fueling demonstrations. I think they start around uh, the 20th of this month, so probably about 10 days from now. And what they'll do there is they'll actually fuel the rocket three times to make sure they can really understand how it gets fueled to get all the precise timing down to get ready for the launch. Then they'll do a hot fire test after that completes and that'll verify that uh, the hold down system works, the launch countdown software works, all those things work. Mm -hmm. And then they'll do a launch uh, probably later this year, probably sometime in December that will launch with a dummy uh, Cygnus capsule on top. It'll be just to check out the launch system to make sure the rocket can operate and we'll get to see that and then they'll do their demonstration to station sometime next year in 2013. So again, I think they're making good progress. Um, lots of challenges is, is, you know, things seem mundane, but, but to deliver, you know, minus 420 some degrees Fahrenheit uh, oxygen at the right conditions and by right conditions, right pressure and flow rates and all mm -hmm. these things is not a trivial experiment at all. It's not trivial to get the launch pad still ready. still rocket science. It's still rocket science. And they'll work through those things. So we'll see how these demonstrations and fill tests go over the next couple of weeks. But again, they're making good solid progress and moving forward. Um, they've got several rockets already at WALPS that are ready to go. They've got a couple Cygnus capsules that are there. So I think once they get through this kind of startup stuff, they'll be ready to go ahead and, and deliver cargo to station, which will be, uh, again, another way to, to, to really effectively utilize station. And, and we really designed it that we need both of these companies. Uh, we can't do it just with SpaceX alone. We need both the cargo delivered by Orbital and by SpaceX to make station functional and get the research that we intended. So, so we're looking, again, for them coming online as soon as they're ready to come online. And again, I get to see the same NASA teams, maybe different teams, working with these folks, helping out up at, uh, with the Orbital team. I've been seeing it where a lot of our folks from Kennedy and Marshall and Stennis who have experience in launch pads and, and mm -hmm. launch design, we ship those up to Wallops and they've been helping the orbital team. They've actually done some work with them hand in hand, done some test conducting with them as they do it through tests, teaching them how to operate and do things. So again, I'm seeing the NASA team take the newer teams and, and give them some experience, help them along over through some of the rough spots, be encouraging. But then I also get to see my team get excited and invigorated about a new way of doing business that they've not had a chance to experience. So again, that, that teaming relationship I described with SpaceX, that same teaming relationship is alive and well with Orbital. And it's a, it's, it's a, it's a tremendous thing for me to get to see um, that drive, that pull of space flight, that wanting to go beyond low Earth orbit to, mm -hmm. to understand what we can do with space station, to understand those research questions, to see these teams get united by that passion and move forward is just is a tremendous uh, blessing for me to get to see these teams work together. Really, f really fascinating to see the synergies between the two teams and really spreading the knowledge out, getting as many people involved in space flight as we possibly can. Really exciting stuff. So. Successful Dragon today. Anything else you'd like to say, real quick? Not really. Again, I think you know, spend the time uh, understanding what's going on with space station. I think uh, here in the next couple of days, there's some good passes of station going overhead, especially in the in the U.S. on the on in Houston and also on the East Coast. So if you get a chance, go outside and watch this little white dot go overhead. Um, I tell people that you also have to have a picture of the crew, so you need a picture of uh, Yuri and Aki and and Sonny, and so you can show your friends that these little, these three people are in that little you know, white look, dot there up there, go. right? And yep. there they go across the sky. So I think, and also spend a little bit of time, go out to the web, research a little bit, find out what the research is we're doing today on space station, and then then figure out a way to talk to your neighbors and friends about what that research is and how that research affects their lives. And so use that little white dot going overhead that you see to, to essentially uh, maybe uh, talk to your friends and neighbors about what you're doing and, and what excitement you see in the space program. So again, uh, uh, my only thought for the day is uh, the weather's been good here in Houston, so if you get a chance, especially tonight or tomorrow night, get a chance to get out there and take a look and see this, this marvelous thing that, that flies overhead. Absolutely, and it, it is amazing to see it too when you see it streaking across the sky and just thinking there are people living on that. It's been up there for 10 years. It's this modern marvel. It really is inspiring. Yep, and you can even say there's a dragon capsule attached and to that. And there's a dragon account. Yep. yep. All right, well, Bill, thank you so much for being here today. Again, Bill Gerstmeyer, Associate Administrator for Human Exploration and Operations. Very successful day. 
Uh, it's, it's been an honor. Okay. Well, thank you very much. All right. Thanks. Thanks.